You're listening to Icebreakers, the podcast exploring all things Canadian and Eurasian, business, culture, and personalities. The series is produced by CECC, the Canada Eurasia Chamber of Commerce. We are a nonprofit focusing on trade, investment, and good relations between Canada and the countries of Eurasia. I'm your host, Nathan Hunt, one of the founders of CECC and former chairman of the National Board. I invite you to tune in regularly for valuable insights related to the region. So we are joined today by a very interesting guest. Continuing with our theme of uh, Canadians in interesting places in Eurasia, we are joined today by Dr. Jean-Francois Caron, an assistant professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan, where he teaches political theory. Prior to his hiring at Nazarbayev University, Dr. Caron served as an assistant professor at the Université de Moncton in Canada and as a lecturer at Université Laval, the uh, Université de Quebec, uh, and Institute of uh, European Studies at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. So he's uh, also a research fellow at the University of Opel in Poland. Uh, his research focuses on various issues, such as the conditions of unity and political stability in multinational states, which is certainly relevant in the uh, area that we cover, uh, and uh, a number of other very interesting topics. He has uh, a number of publications, which I, we don't have time to read here, but uh, he's uh, a very interesting person, and we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Hello, Jean-Francois. Hello, how are you? I'm okay. Do you mind if I call you Jean-Francois and not Dr. Caron? No problem. <laughs> Although you earned a PhD and I didn't, perhaps I should show a little more respect, right? <laughs> well, it's fine. I don't, I mean, my students are really, I mean, they're eager. They're calling me doctor, professor. It's very important for, for them. But um, when I was teaching in Canada, my students were, some, some, some of my students were calling me GF. So. Oh, okay. Great. That's fine. So tell me a little bit about yourself, just, uh, you know, without the, the Eurasia component, what, what is it that made you decide to be a teacher? Why are you an educator in general? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, actually, my, my father was, um, was an high school teacher. And I remember whenever um, I had uh, days off uh, at school, he was taking me in his own classes. So there was like a, a, a special, um, I mean, th there was th there was a place where they were um, just putting the books, and uh, so, so I was hiding there. So I was just listening to my father giving his um, his classes. So I was like six, seven, eight years old, and um, he was sometimes he was even like asking me to um, have a look at the copies he was grading. So from I mean, from a very young age, I was kind of integrated within this uh, this this tradition of, of of education so maybe this is this is why i've decided to um to become a, a professor and i'm not a very good hockey player so that kind of <laughs> limited my options as well in cam there you're either going to be a hockey player or a professor right yeah 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 you have to yeah <laughs> So I'm not a good skater. Okay. So uh, no, but I think it's coming from my my father from from my father's side. Yeah. Well, it's it's in your genes. That's uh, that's good to hear. I'm assuming that the place where you teach uh, uh, the the language of instruction is English, right? Or is it French? Perhaps all the classes are in English except the the language classes. So 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 we have various classes in French, Spanish. German, Korean. So these classes are taught in these languages, but all the other classes are taught in English. The students have to write their papers, their exams in English. They have to talk to professors in English, and all the staff, the uh, HR people, they have to uh, they have to talk to us um, in English. But uh, but I mean, I've been here for seven years, and most people who are staying for more than two three years. They're taking Russian or even Kazakh classes because once you leave campus, I mean, you need to speak Russian or Kazakh. So I, I started to learn Russian a few years ago. So I had to stop, unfortunately, to take classes because of the pandemic. But uh, I mean, my knowledge of Russian is basic enough that I can um, order food in restaurants and I can even um, tell people um, where to go. So, so I would say that my Russian is. Uh, basic slash intermediate there we go um do you teach french no no all my classes are in english and i'm only teaching classes in related to political theory 
So, um, so I'm teaching Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Machiavelli, um, all in English. And I'm asking my students to do the readings also in English. Machiavelli. There's, there's a misunderstood man, by the way. Uh, you know, the word Machiavellian means something evil in, uh, in the English language. But uh, what he wrote was, was, I would say, I wouldn't call it evil. It was just very pragmatic. <laughs> like, like, this is the way the world works, kiddies. <laughs> yeah, reason of state. He's the one who came up with this idea. And uh, ever since, and the, since the past 500 years, leaders and societies have been driven, organized by a Machiavellian uh, thought, uh, even though we don't like it. I mean, this is the case. And it's probably more the case in this part of the world, in Central Asia and Russia as well. The Machiavellian component is more present than probably anywhere else in the world. It certainly is. It certainly is. So you teach Machiavelli. Who, who else do you teach? Do you teach Rousseau? Do you teach uh, Hobbes, perhaps? Yeah. So uh, my intro class in political theory, it's really from Plato till Francis Fukuyama. So I'm covering Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, Marx, all these famous political philosophers. With Plato, is it the Republic that you start with? Republic, yeah. Well, good for you. I had a, a class in political theory uh, uh, with a bunch of oligarchs. We, we imported uh, professors from Yale University. It was something set up by a Yale grad, not, not me. Uh, and uh, it was a great, uh, great little two-year study program where uh, a bunch of people with money, and I wasn't one of them, but a bunch of people with money, uh, uh, you know, got pooled their resources and, and brought professors in to give lectures uh, in Russia for one week at a time. It was a very, very great uh, program. It helped me return to the classics after having read them 30 years ago. I'm a little older than you, Jean-Francois. Well, the thing with classics is that they're universal. So you can teach them in Canada, in France, in Kazakhstan, exactly the same way. Because the message of Plato, Aristotle is or transcending times and, and culture. And so I that's mean, a very good observation, a very good observation compared with the students I had in Canada or in Belgium. I mean, they're they're able to understand what these philosophers were talking about 2000, 2500 years ago. So and this is this is why we are still teaching them. They still have something to, to teach us when it comes to democracy or the organization of, of societies. Yeah, they sure do. They sure do. Now, tell me, how is it that you ended up in Kazakhstan? But let's start from the beginning. Um, you know, you, you, you finished your PhD. Uh, you're not that old. What are you? Are you in your 30s, I'm going to guess? Early 40s. Early 40s. Well, yeah. there you have it. You finished your PhD. Uh, Where did you go to teach uh, right, right as soon as you got out of school? So I finished my PhD in 2010. Then uh, I ended up at the University of Moncton from 2011 until 2014. Then I've spent a year working for the Quebec government at the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs. And then one year later, uh, I got this offer to come and work in um, in Kazakhstan. So, um, so I thought after. But you I, have a Polish connection in there. What, what did you do in Poland? So I, I'm in the. I'm a researcher, so uh, with this university in Poland, so which just basically allows me to um, to be able to um, to ask uh, for grants uh, with the European Union Polish National Research Center. But I'm not physically there. I'm not. I'm not teaching there. So it's just a, an affiliation, just like with the Institute of Peace and uh, and Diplomacy in Toronto. Uh, I, I'm affiliated with them. So um, so you can ask for grants. Can you get me an affiliation? I'd also like to have some grants from the EU. Yeah, why not? Poland is a great place. I mean, I've been there a couple of times in this city in Opole. It's a great. I mean, it, it's the capital of a, a province the equivalent of a province and uh, it's the smallest province in Poland and the city barely has 100,000 people. So you have all the services of a capital in a very, very small city. It's a gorgeous city. You have canals and it's next to the Oder River. And how do you pronounce the city name? Opole. Opole. Okay. Opole. If you pronounce the E at the end or not. Okay. Opole. Well, very interesting. So you didn't actually physically locate to Poland. You went straight from Canada to Kazakhstan. Is that right? Yep. I arrived here August 9, 2015. I still remember. It was a long flight. And I'm going to get personal here. Did you find love in Kazakhstan? On my first day. My very first day. So <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I arrived. I mean, I know because I can tell my wife, you know, we've met 
August 9, 2015, I still have the stamp in my passport. So I arrived at that four. Was, uh, that was just one week ago. Yeah. So, I mean, I arrived at four, three, four in the morning. So I went to sleep immediately. And then at 12, uh, someone from the university, they uh, drove us with other faculty who had just arrived with me to the, the grocery store to exchange some money, to get a SIM card. And then I just stayed in the, the um, shopping center where we went. And I just decided to go for um, sushi. And um, just like probably a typical North American, I just said to myself, everybody in the world speaks English, which is not the case in Kazakhstan. So I was trying to order my food uh, in English and the waitress just didn't understand anything. And turns out, turns out that the person who ended up being my wife was sitting at the next table and she heard the whole thing and she was probably laughing with her friend and she just said, looks like you need some help with translation. You look very hungry and if I'm not helping you, you're going to be starving. So... <laughs> Can I help you? What What would you like? So so she helped me order, and I sat with her, and we exchanged phone number, and the rest is history. We got married the year later, and now we have three kids. Oh, good for you! What a what a great story! Good lord, what a great story! Uh, I thought you were going to tell me we met her on August 9th. She was the one that stamped my passport entering the country. <laughs> no, I mean I, I mean I mean the flight it was like M- Montreal to Toronto, Toronto Istanbul, then Istanbul Astana with all the connections, the delays. It took I took something like 30 hours. So when I arrived in Astana I was I mean I was a zombie. I don't even remember uh what the airport looked like. It's uh this, so this is the thing when you're traveling in this part of the world. It's um, it's it's never easy. The the flights are always long, and hopefully at some. I mean, I've heard that Air Astana, the the um, national company, is trying to develop a direct flight from Astana or Nur Sultan directly to New York City. Oh, okay. So if if this is ever happening, this will be a life savior. This this would be great. So they're working on it. I don't know where they are with the pandemic. Probably. Uh, uh, everything everything was was delayed, but they they were. I've heard that they were working on on. Well, it. in the current geopolitical situation, getting from point A to point B has never been more complex. I can tell you, some of our members travel still travel to the Russian Federation, and getting to Russia involves dog sleds and uh, uh, hitchhiking some of the time. So it's not easy. So tell me a little bit about. Your, your, your students, what is it that inspires you? Can you tell us a story about you know, something that's happened while you were teaching that, uh, that sticks in your mind, uh, you know, or perhaps a particular student that sticks in your mind? Or, you know, what, what, has, uh, what has touched you while you've been in Kazakhstan? So this is the reason why I took this job. It's because I really embraced the, um, the system, the logic behind Nazarbayev University. Students here are not paying tuition fees, and they are recruited only based on their merit, on their knowledge of English, and they have to pass some of some some students, depending on the program in which they are applying, they have to pass an interview with faculty, with professors. So we're questioning them, like, why do you want to study in political science? And some of them are saying, well, because I want to be prime minister, I want to be president, I want to be a, a, the ambassador of my country at the UN Security Council or whatever. So we're questioning them. We're, we're asking them, are you listening to podcasts? Uh, are you following the news? And if we realize that they're not really interested in political science, we're not admitting them. It's, it's as simple as that. So it's really based on merit. They're not paying tuition fees. They are staying on campus. Most of them, they're staying on campus for free. They have a room in the dormitories, and they're even rec- even receiving a stipend every month. It's, it's not enough. It, it, I mean, it, it's not a lot. It's about one hundred dollars a month, but still. So they don't pay anything, and they are basically paid to study. So this is my conception of what higher education should be. You got to be interested in a topic, and you need to deserve your place in the institution. Just the simple fact of just paying and just expecting a good grade at the end of the semester. For me, this is not what education should be. And when I was teaching in Canada, I remember it happened a couple of times. I have had students at the end of the semester, one student in particular, he came to my office and he just dropped an envelope in front of me on my desk. And he just said, I'm here to talk about my grade. I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, you got the grade that you deserved. You should just, just realize and and wonder how come I got 
75% why I didn't get 90% and then you work from there and then you you should be able to analyze the reasons why you got this grade and you should be able to just improve yourself in the following semesters so this is this is the re- part of the reason why I've quit um, uh, education university uh, if between 2014 and 2015 just the way education is is working in uh, in in Canada or, or anywhere else in in the western world is just i mean this is this is not in line with my my conception of what education should be so here this is completely different so our students they are highly motivated there's always i would say that in a class of 100 students i have probably have the f- first three or four rows of students they are just listening to me paying attention taking notes they're participating this is something i've never seen in my life in canada you have like two three students who are actually interested in the class all the other ones are on their phone this is completely different here that's very interesting that's very interesting you know i i I never thought about that you know as a probably a more more political conservative than than a liberal uh i I think that education should be for pay because things cost money uh but what you're describing is a system where you really take the best and the brightest uh, and give them education free of charge because they deserve it. And that's that's a very interesting concept. And if at some point during their their uh, their four years with us, they're no longer meeting the expectations, they they can be expelled. If they are cheating, if they're they're doing plagiarism, they are also expelled. So we're also teaching them the importance of the the ethics of research, the ethics of of work. So uh, I mean, the expectations are pretty high. And um, so, I mean, this is really motivating for a, for a professor. And this is the thing as well. So since students are, are not paying tuition fees, it's open to anyone based on merits. And I will always remember that that student during my first year, she, so she took my class and she was always sitting in the corner and she was not talking to any other students. And I've noticed after two, three weeks that she was always dressed with the same clothes. So I realized that she was coming from a poor background and she was just embracing this opportunity to get a more than decent education and then eventually uh, go and study abroad or go and work for a for a big international company in, in the country and be able to help her family and it turns out she actually wrote me a week ago and uh now she's working for kpmg oh really um, and, and 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 basically she i mean this is this is my my understanding that probably n- no one in her family actually went to uh, to university. So she she's the only one with a university degree in her family. Now with her job, she's probably helping her her family, her, her parents, her siblings. But uh, but she was able to achieve that simply based on her merit. Did she get a second set of clothes? Most likely, yes. Now if she's working for KPMG, yes, <laughs> she <laughs> she, she so. needs to, and she she's able to. Uh, to afford that, so this is what I like about this um, the logic behind the the university of, university for which I'm I, I'm working. Uh, I feel like we are really making a difference, and um, and it's not because your parents are well connected with a member of parliament that you will automatically be admitted. This is just not how it's working, and we've had cases in the past where we've had kids from well, very well connected family who just didn't meet the expectation. And they were not admitted. So uh, You just touched on my next question. I was going to say, I know that part of the world, Jean-Francois, and don't you tell me there's no corruption there. Surely you have one or two students who are in there just because of their connections. And you're, and you're telling me that's not the case. It's uh, No, really, honestly, it's very difficult. When, I mean, st- students are told, I mean, my former dean, the former dean once told me, uh, so parents came to his office and they offered him um, half a dozen horses just hoping that it, their their kid would be would be admitted so knowing how things are working in the country i mean you cannot refuse a gift that would be offensive but then he also had to make them realize like i do understand this is part of the culture it, it's really important for you and i understand that th- this is a gift but you also have to understand where i'm coming from the logic behind the university and we just cannot do that if your 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 son really deserves is is really good enough to be admitted, he will be admitted. You will not have to give me anything. But if he's not good enough, 
even if you give me horses, it's it's, it's just not going to work. I can tell you why. If he's not admitted, I can tell you why he wasn't admitted, and maybe he can try again next year. But I mean, so so it wasn't a strange situation. I, I don't have to deal with these uh, situation. This is not my uh, my level, uh, my pay scale. Uh, but um, so I mean, people who are at this level, they have to face these these sorts of uh, of situations that are less and less common because now the word has spread and people know in the country after more than ten years of existence that this is really this is the rule of meritocracy. If your English is good enough, your grades are good enough, you've worked hard enough in high school, you will be admitted. And, and the education here. Uh, the annual, the value, the actual cost of a one year of education here is almost 20,000 US dollars. So people know they can spend here four years, uh, so, which is actually worth uh, $80,000. They, they will not pay one single tenge. And it's funded by the government, yes. yeah? Or is it funded by a private foundation? Yes, or by the government. So we have, we have a handful of students who are paying tuition fees, students who really want to come here some of them are paying t tuition fees but i would say that it's more than 95 percent of students they're they're studying free of charge and i mean again and would you say the ones who study free of charge are more motivated than the ones who are paying because that's a paradox yeah oh yeah 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 well they're not paying their parents are paying um no, so, exactly <laughs> but those a, a lot of students they real they realize the chance that they have and uh, they know based on the the previous years we've just in our program we have um, undergrad undergraduate students who ended up being admitted at um, Harvard University of Chicago uh, Oxford Cambridge so i mean they know that if they're working really hard they, i mean they have a bright future and our our diploma our degrees are are recognized around the world and uh, from what i was told by uh, professors working in the north american or european universities they're really saying that you're really giving them a good solid foundation in, in political science they're among one of the they're among the brightest students that they have in their graduate program so and this is the thing as well like, Based on the the writers you just told me, uh, that's uh, that that's it. Yeah. That covers the the gamut, you know. And this is also the logic with meritocracy. You are good enough to study here for free, so I'm going to push you hard. I mean, you're you're going to learn. You you will study, because if you don't study, you're basically wasting eighty thousand dollars with your education. You you cannot waste taxpayers' money. So I mean, I will give you the best education that I can, and there and. They're they're actually doing their readings, which is amazing because and most of students in Canada when I was teaching there we just were not doing their readings at all, which which really surprised me when I arrived seven years ago. They were actually asking me specific questions about one sentence in the text I asked them to um, to read. First time it ever happened to me. It's an educator's dream. It sounds like. Yep. So tell me this, I got to ask about the 5%. 95% of the people there are free, they're they're based on merits, but 5% are paying. Are those people that didn't get in, you know, they couldn't have made it uh, for the for the free tuition, but they are able to 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 pay yeah. and attend anyway. Yeah, this is my understanding. Yeah. Like if you really want to come and study here and you're willing to pay, um fine. But but these students they know right from the start that they don't really have they're they're not really meeting the basic expectations, but if you want to come, if you want to pay, fine. But And do you notice a difference among those students? Or maybe you don't know who's paying. Yeah, who's we don't paying. know who's paying and who's on a, a state scholarship. Yeah, That's fine. That's fine. I got to ask you about the pandemic. You know, it was, uh, I have some friends who are educators uh, in, the, in the West, and they said it was a disaster. You know, during the pandemic, the, the, we had classes on Zoom, even university classes, and it's not the same. Uh, and it it uh, it was a it, it really set education back by a year or two. What was your experience in uh, in Astana in Nur Sultan? I, it, did did you did you uh, have problems with the pandemic? So we had a, a lockdown uh, in the spring of of twenty twenty, like most of other places in the world. Um, so we uh, there were severe restrictions. Uh, we couldn't really 
go out of our apartments or um, houses on campus. But then the restrictions were lifted at the uh, end of May, beginning of June of 2020. And then things really started to come back to normal. But we've been teaching classes online for the past two years. So I, I had my first class, my first in-person class yesterday. Uh, first time in, in oh, two, really? more, than, more than two years. So it felt a bit strange. I mean, it's good for students and because most of the students I have in this class are first year or second year students. So they will not really be in, impacted by, by, by the pandemic. What is really unfortunate were um, students who were third year students and fourth year students. So they had to complete their last two years. So half of their education was was online. Uh, so we did our best, but um, the problem, problem, main problem was with the assignment. Uh, we had to change the assignment because when students have to do their exams online, they can cheat. Uh, they can exchange answers. So we had to come up with ways that would prevent cheating. Uh, that was the first challenge, and the second challenge was mostly for them because part of education is you're you're building a network, you're you're making friends that, that will remain your friends for the rest of your life, and by not being able to interact physically with one another, so this will have an impact on these uh, students who had to complete their degree, their last two years of their degree, uh, online because of the pandemic. So, uh, so fall of 21 yeah. and spring of 22, you were still online. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My poor daughter, she studies in San Francisco. She can't do it online. She says, it's just not the same dad. I don't, I don't get it. I, I don't feel motivated. And it's, it's psychological because the information doesn't change, but, uh, psychologically there's something about the classroom setting that is just more conducive to learning, yeah. I believe. And it's a, uh, it's very difficult on zoom to have discussion groups so if you have, you see, they have to raise their hands, and if someone speaks when somebody else is speaking, the the the, the screen is, becomes shared, and it, it it's so it, it's beca- it's becoming very difficult to to follow. Uh, while in a classroom, I mean, th- there's something that I mean that will never ne- that will never be better than like a f- physical interaction in a in a classroom. So I'm really happy that I mean th- this is th- this is more certainly in our case behind us. I know in Kazakhstan, our university made a test at the end of the summer of 2020 with the employees of the university. So security guards, janitors, and students and faculty. And uh, the results were astonishing. So at the end of of the summer of 2020, almost half of people who passed a a blood test had uh, antibodies, meaning that half of our employees had caught COVID between March and july august of 2020 uh, so that, that's almost herd immunity right yeah yeah so and this is this wasn't really i mean this wasn't really surprising because uh even though there was a lockdown and everything was closed they were there were huge traffic jams uh in north sultan on saturdays and sundays so people were going to their family they were uh, they were having they were organizing uh, get-togethers uh, family meetings with two dozen people, and um, so I mean, people got contaminated uh, very quickly here, and so at least. But the advantage is that compared with uh, Canada, for instance, the um, average um, age in Kazakhstan is thirty-one or thirty-two years old. So knowing that COVID has more impact on the elderly, people with um, with uh, medical preconditions. Uh, I think the average age of the population in Canada is 42, 43 years old, while it is 31 or 32 years old in Canada. So a lot of people, many people got infected, but because they were young, they didn't end up, ended up at the uh, at the hospital. So were you able to develop any innovative techniques to teach online that you wouldn't have developed without the pandemic, or was it more or less just a minus? <laughs> I mean, I was able to. Uh, I've managed to um, figure out how to upload videos on YouTube. Um, <laughs> okay, that's a start. <laughs> but other than that, uh, that was really that was really painful. That was probably the, the the worst two years of my of my career. It was really depressing. Couldn't see our, our students, and now some of them are asking me to write them letters of recommendation. 
So it's it, it's very difficult to actually say something about them because I don't actually yeah. know them. I was never able to just have coffee with them or enjoy lunch at the canteen with them and talk about their family, their background, their goals in life. So yeah, that that was painful. I think that was the case for everybody. It's funny because I hear the same from my friends who are educators in the U.S. and Canada. I hear the same thing. It's 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 not the same. For, I, I wanted to say if there are any other stories you have about your students or about something memorable, but uh, the, but uh, later I wanted to turn to Canada too and talk about opportunities for cooperation with Canada. So are there any other stories you want to tell or should we talk about cooperation? Well, I should tell you two stories, like experiences I, I've had here in, um, in Kazakhstan. So my wife is Kazakh and once um, I, um, I, um, I took care of dinner and her mom was, was with us. So at the end of the meal, she... she, she told me in Kazakh, Rakhmet, which means thank you. And I asked my wife, so how do you say you're welcome in Kazakh? So she said, so you need to say Asbolson. So in my mind, Asbolson means you're welcome. Asbolson. Asbolson. Okay. So a few weeks later, I was waiting for the lift. And when the door opened, there was um, a plumber or an electrician, and he was carrying a ladder on his shoulder and a, a toolbox. I just held the door so he took everything out and he he was Kazakh so he looked at me and he said Rachmet so I just looked at him and said well you're welcome so as Bolson and he just the guy just was stunned and he looked at me and he started to add this little smile on his face so I just realized right from that moment that I I said something wrong you think so you're I, speaking Kazakh, but you ain't. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, I thought I spoke Kazakh, but okay, maybe the pronunciation. I, I said, you know, so I got on the lift, and when I'm, mean, you, you, you need to think about the situation. So the guy, I got on the lift. The guy was looking at me, still like smiling a little bit. The door was closing. He was still looking at me and smiling. The lift was going up, and I just felt like, saw the guy was like still looking at me and smiling. I was like, oh my god, I said something wrong. Went back to the apartment told the story to my wife, and she started to laugh. She said, oh, my God. So so I should have been more precise. Asbolson means you're welcome in the context of food. So basically, it means bon appétit. Uh, so, okay. Uh-huh, okay. So what, I mean, what should I, what should I, 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 I have said to the guy? He said, well, you should have said, aho sa Like, oh, my God, you have different ways of saying you're welcome. So, and the guy is working on campus. He's an electrician or a plumber. He's working on campus. And every once in a while, I see him and he recognizes him. He, he still recognizes me and he's still looking at me and he still has this smile. On Next face. time you see him, tell him, bon appétit. So, <laughs> bon appétit, yeah. He's probably telling that story to uh, all of his friends and they're laughing. I, I told that story to my students. They were all laughing. I mean, I mean laughing, not not fake laughs. They were really genuinely Laughing. There's, there's so. one there's one thing that Russian translators always end up with, and especially in the food industry. You know, we have the word preservative in the food industry. It means something that preserves, you know, the taste or the or the whole wholesomeness of food. Well, in the Russian language, the word preservative means condom. And very often you will hear translators who are just out of university, maybe a little green, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the English is, we don't use preservatives in our products. And the translator says, this company doesn't use condoms in their products. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's always an amusing yeah. one. Anyway, are there any other stories you wanted to tell? Because I want to talk about cooperation with Canada as well. Yeah. Well, there's also, the, I mean, it's typical, if you come to a Kazakh wedding or any Kazakh event, yeah. uh, there, there are always two dozen people, at least two dozen people. If you go to a Kazakh wedding, there are 200 people right. and everybody is making a, is proposing a toast. So when I, my wife first took me to her um, um, uncle's place, all the other uncles and aunts and cousins were there, like two dozen people were there. And she told me, like, this is how it's going to work. Everybody's going to make propose a toast, and at the end of the toast, you need to drink what's in your shot. Drink to the bottom. Vodka. Uh, okay. Oh, my God. So when I, I came in, I just saw t- t- like two dozen people. So, oh, my God. This is going to be a rough evening. <laughs> and in the last half an is. hour. <laughs> yeah. And in the first half an hour, I mean, all of them proposed a toast. So you can only imagine I'm 125 pounds. So after... Half an hour. You're, you're not a big guy. I'm looking at you. Our, our listeners can't see you. I'm not a big guy. <laughs> no. 
no. So um, it took me like two days to recover. And uh, my wife, she uh, after two days, she she said, "We need to talk." It's like like what you did was unacceptable. You like you got drunk in front of my family. Said, hey, you told me after every talk I had to to, to drink the, the shot. I said, well, you didn't have to drink the whole glass. <laughs> oh, like, that's right. You know what? <laughs> These are the sorts of details that are very important. You should have told me before, not now. So we still we're still seeing these um, her uncles and um, I mean they're still again with a smile on their face like want a glass of vodka. <laughs> so, right. And I'm sure that, I mean uh, I, I've asked uh, I've told uh, that story to to my friends who are also married with um, with Kazakhs and they said yeah I, I went through this as well. Yeah, well you can hear the same problem in all of the countries of the region. Believe me, I got to ask you about cooperation with Canada. Uh, because we are a Canadian uh, organization focused on improving ties between Canada and Kazakhstan. And I get the impression that you're not really focused, perhaps, on cooperations with Canadian educational institutions or perhaps Canadian students. You know, they don't play a role in what you're doing now. But could they? Uh, are there any opportunities for cooperation with Canada that you might see or that we could be exploring, perhaps with Nazarbayev University, perhaps with other uh, agencies or institutions in Kazakhstan. What are, what are your thoughts about potential cooperation with Canada? Because that's what we promote yeah. at CECC. I mean, from a, from an educational perspective, there are tremendous possibilities for Canadian students. Um, Nazarev University is is starting to uh, to become more of an international university, and we are starting to welcome more and more international students. And there are special special grants for them. Um, so again, a student from Canada could come and do a MA, a PhD, and uh, wouldn't wouldn't spend one dollar. Uh, the student would have um, uh, a room in the dorm, wouldn't get the stipend, however, but uh, would study for free. Um, so could also act as a research assistant, a teaching assistant. Um, so uh, and I mean, in just for instance, we have a school of um, mining. Mining is a big industry in Kazakhstan. It's also a big industry in Canada. Uh, so, so there are these sorts of schools um, where a lot of Canadian students uh, could come and study and learn a lot uh, and uh, then come back to Canada and uh, find um, a proper job in, the, in their field. Um, so, I mean, this is... Uh, this is, there's a tremendous opportunity, but I mean, most of people don't know the university yet. It's been established in 2010, 2011, so we're still barely 10 years old. Uh, we're, I've, I've been on the campus. It's beautiful, beautiful building, by the way. It's, yeah, it's a huge campus. I mean, it's probably bigger than any other campuses in in Canada. It's a very huge place. Um, so, um, and and after 10 years, I think what we've accomplished in 10 years is pretty amazing. Um, we got our first international ranking this year, this year. So our degrees are, are recognized are more and more recognized. And I can tell at least in political science, what students are learning in our program is the same thing they are learning at the university of Toronto or university of British Columbia, focusing on integrity, the skills they're learning, uh, really it's the, the equivalent. So it's same thing with our MA program. Uh, there's also a, MA program in Eurasian studies. So I know there's a, at the University of Toronto, there is a, a program in Eurasian studies. So uh, we've been trying in, in the past to establish a collaboration with uh, this university. Again, the pandemic just uh, slowed everything, everything. But um, I mean, we're getting there. And it's just a matter of years before we are really establishing really strong connections with uh, other universities that will just like make it easier for students to come and study here. Any Canadian student who would like to come and study here, um, as long as that student is meet, meeting the, the requirements of the program, again, meritocracy, so everybody's welcome and, uh, and, and you're studying for free. I'm going to assume that you don't have any Canadians studying there yet, but what other, uh, what other countries are represented? So we have uh, students from Pakistan, India, we have a few Chinese students, and I was told that in our MA program, we have, I think, two or three African students this year. 
So this will be a first, first students from Africa. From developing countries, but it sounds like the program is great. You could have people from developed countries as well. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. In the past, we've had uh, two American students. We've had two American students who studied with, with us. Um, so as far as I can, I can remember, I think only one of them was able to complete the degree. Oh, wow. One, uh, the other one withdrew from the program. So, I mean, the, the expectations are pretty high. And as far as I can remember, my, my MA, at the, which was at the University of Ottawa, I think that the expectations are higher here than they were at the, back 50 year, 15 years ago at the University of, uh, of Ottawa. Well, based on what you've told me about your students and your program, uh, probably the results are, are higher than what we get in the West as well, because you have very highly motivated people, it sounds like. Yeah, and, I mean, since you're, and, and you're spending taxpayers' money, so students who are not working hard, uh, we have no hesitation of expelling them. So the expectations are high. And uh, if you're not willing to work, we have to tell we have to tell these students, we're sorry, but I mean, Understood. Th- this place is not for you. Tell me, what is it you think that made you a leader? I mean, you're a leader in the educational sphere. What is it that made you a leader? I think that, I mean, the quality of a leader is you need to lead the way. You cannot ask others to do things you're not willing to do yourself. So my students are always telling me, like, you're so demanding compared with other professors. You're asking us to read sometimes 100 pages a week. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm telling them, yeah, but you know what? This is what I'm reading every day. Yeah, you're asking us to write a 7,000-word 7, dissertation by the end of the semester. I mean, no other professors are asking that. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm publishing two, three books a year. So if I can do it, you can do it as well. I'm not a genius. I'm just a hardworking guy. And I mean, if you want to succeed, y- you need to be hardworking as well. Don't be afraid of, uh, of doing what, what needs to be done. Everybody can, everybody can do it. It's not a matter of you, you were born or not with a special talent. It has nothing to do with that. Just work hard. But then if you want to convince them that it is the case, you need to show them uh, yourself. You need to lead the way. Lead by example, as they say. Yeah. Good for you. And again, uh, when I was chair of the department, when you're telling your colleagues, and you know, you need to work harder, you need to, to, to publish more. I mean, y- this means that you have to be the first one in your office in the morning and you have to be the last one to leave your office in the evening. And yourself, you also have to, to, to publish good. Um, so, yeah, so you, understood. I mean, this, this puts pressure on you, uh, and, and it's necessary for any leader. What does the future hold for you? You've been there seven years, Dr. Caron, do you, do you, do you see yourself continuing for another two or three years and then looking around, or maybe you're, we want to settle down and stay in Kazakhstan for the rest of your life. What do you think the future holds? I have a discussion recently with, with my wife, uh, and we've decided that, um, if things don't change, there's no reason for, for us to, to leave the country to go and live in Canada or anywhere else, anywhere else in the world. We're happy here. University is great. Um, our kids are growing up. They can have a... So our eldest daughter will start a French school. So as long as our kids can go to a, an American uh, school, a French school, they, as long as they can have these sorts of opportunities, we don't see any reasons why, why we should leave. I'm actually calling Kazakhstan my Good own. Good for you. When I was going back to Canada before the pandemic, it felt always strange, like you traveling back to where you were born, where you've spent most of your life, but then you you don't rec- necessarily recognize people anymore. Their their values have, have, I mean, they haven't changed, but you have changed, and you don't re- really recognize yourself and their their values, their their behavior, with their life choices. So it always felt kind of weird to go back to Canada. And I was always kind of happy when I was on the plane flying back to, to Kazakhstan. I, I was telling my, my wife, like, we're going back home. And first time I said that, it felt strange. Like, oh, did I just say that Kazakhstan is my home? And then I, I just realized, yeah, it is. Uh, in a way, I, I, I became a little bit uh, Kazakh. Um, well, believe me, I know what you're saying because I've been to Kazakhstan many times and it is a great country. Uh, I love Kazakhstan. The, the, the people are, are as, as you know, as warm and as welcoming as anywhere in the world, uh, probably more so than most places in the world. They're, they're happy to, 
they are a developing country uh, in the in the strong sense of the word. They're happy to embrace other cultures, to learn from from foreigners uh, who visit. I've never felt more welcome uh, uh, in uh, in most places than I do in Kazakhstan. I can tell you. I that. think I think what is striking, and uh, so my mom, she she witnessed it for she, she stayed with us for for two months, and uh, whenever she was invited somewhere, she was treated as a queen, as an empress like the most important person in the room. Like, like you're coming from abroad, you're coming from very far, and, and you have, I mean, you're 78 years old, so you're the eldest person in the room, so there's this, this special, special chair, special space in the room, this is for you, and I mean, she said, like, I'm not treated like that in Canada. I mean, when, when I'm back in Quebec, I go to a, the grocery store, I go to the bank, and I'm waiting in line just like anybody else. I don't have any special treatment. But here you feel like, I mean, the elderly, they are treated in a way like, I mean, it's nothing comparable with how they, they are treated in, in Quebec or, uh, or in Canada. See, I'm smiling because my elderly mother... Uh, also visited Central Asia. It wasn't Kazakhstan, it was Uzbekistan, but uh, this was just uh, just before the pandemic, so I'm going to say three years ago. And she had the exact same experience. Everywhere she went, she was carried on uh, on people's shoulders. She was treated like royalty. We arrived at a museum. The, the entire museum was shut down because we were too late. They closed at 7 p.m. We arrived at 7 p.m. And they opened the whole thing up because they heard my elderly mother was uh, in town uh, having traveled across the ocean just to see the play. They opened it up for her. You know, just just amazing things that uh, you'll see in Central Asia you won't see in many other countries. Well, it has been a, a pleasure, really, uh, talking with you, learning about your life, and hearing that there is some place, some corner in the world where education is still sacred, where, where, where people still try and are proud to, to, to learn and to commune with their instructors. I, I think that's... Uh, that really is a, a beautiful thing, and it's something that is uh, becoming more and more, unfortunately, scarce in the world in which we live. So I'm so happy that you found a corner of the world that's beautiful, that you can call home. You found love there. You have a wife. You have three beautiful kids. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Dr. Caron, I'll close with a little bit of respect. <laughs> uh, and in any case, we have been speaking. We've been joined today by Dr. Jean-Francois Caron, an associate professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. Thank you again for your time, Dr. Caron, and we look forward to our future contacts. Thank you for welcoming me. Bye-bye now. You've been listening to Icebreakers, a podcast produced by CECC, the Canada-Eurasia Chamber of Commerce, supporting trade, investment, and good relations between Canada and the nations of Eurasia. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to the show and give us a review on Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. You can join our LinkedIn group to address questions to guests. To find out more about the series or to make a donation, please check out our website at www.cecpodcast.com. Thanks for tuning in.